Thanks for having me. I'm Johan Torsen. And I'll basically try to complement the code this presentation based by talking a bit about what's what's more inside the cluster. Uh, let me start by introducing myself. I'm I have a background as an engineering researcher. I spent some 15 years trying to automate and use artificial intelligence to optimize IT operations. In a, initially in an academic context, but then I said that, well, let's also do this commercially. So we founded our company called Elasticis that were doing you know, all sorts of things, cloud automation, very early ran into containers and Kubernetes and so on. And then a couple of years later, bumped into all of these questions from various companies trying to modernize their IT infrastructures, going from virtual machines to containers and these things while still trying to fulfill various types of regulatory requirements. So they could be in FinTech or MedTech and so needed to basically, they wanted the speed of Kubernetes, but still their security teams are sort of holding them back saying that, well, we know how to do the physical firewalls, but we don't understand this container thing. So how can we really get the speed of cloud native, but still being secure and compliant? And after doing that for, as various type of professional services, contracts and gigs for some years, we basically said, well, let's package this up. And we did in our own Kubernetes distribution that we call compliant Kubernetes for the lack of a cooler Greek name. And that we offer open source and we can also manage it for customers that want that. And what I want to do today is to share some of those insights that we gain in while working with various uh, users and customers uh, that led to the creation of our distribution. So, I mean, as Koda mentioned, we're in a, a larger context here. We're not just only looking at what to do really with the Kubernetes cluster. And in particular, when you talk about regulatory compliance, this is very wide all the way down from how to basically have physical security for your data center, to your clusters, to various things you need to do to your particular applications and also some user policies for your organization. And I mean, in addition, you have various external uh, tools and components as well. For example, logging and backups that is hopefully external to your cluster where you have that have implications for compliance and security. So, I mean, the, the problem really with Kubernetes is that it's been so successful. So there's, there's a big obstacle in turning various security controls on by default, because I mean, it's supposed to be used everywhere. And with that, there's a, some, some dilemma already. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of ways of securing the cluster and many of these are really, really not on by default. And in addition, you commonly also need a lot of external services that may or may not be obvious that you should really use. So I mean, let's start by, by logging. And I mean, of course, it's great to log you're doing in your applications, but it's also very good to log what's actually happening in your Kubernetes system. And I mean, here's just some uh, simple YAML showing that how to actually enable audit logging for your cluster itself, which is a great great practice to do to really be able to track changes of who is really modifying your system and, and in what way. And then as I mentioned, it's also a good, um, good practice to keep these logs in a temper-proof environment, sort of far away from your cluster. Then if that is hosting them yourself or sending to some log hosting service, it can, it can differ depending on the use case you're having. So let me move and just fly over this. And then, of course, connecting back to uh, this uh, this question of audit logging, so who is doing what? And I mean, we commonly see rather poor practices around account management. So there's quite a lot of use of cluster admin tokens being shared by developers. So someone has been changing it, but something, but it's not really traceable back to a single person. And I mean, for that reason, we strongly recommend that you would actually integrate with the real identity management solution that you commonly would have in your organization anyway. 
So, I mean, here we would propose to use something like Dex or Key Cloak. I mean, in the Dex case, you would then connect back to your your own LLAP or Active Directory or whatnot you may be using, either through OpenID Connect or for SAML. Um, here's just some example YAML for how to actually point to the authentication provider to use, and then also here in the case of OpenID Connect, we need to map to the username and also a group that we will later use for connecting this to our back. And I mean here, I guess a, a very good principle is to really define different roles, to not just run in the sort of everyone is allowed to do everything, and then limit limit access really to what is needed for the particular particular job and uh, sort of. I would I would recommend to be rather liberal with viewing rights, but very very limited writing rights in particular when it comes to actually actual policies. So that uh, that would for sure not be written writable by different people. So let me move on a bit. I mean uh, here. I think as Coda mentioned a bit and also in the previous questions. I mean, Kubernetes is a rather complex system with a lot of different subsystems and a lot of different, let's call it domains or so. And I mean, here it's, it's, it's all about trying to understand and uh, limit the blast radius. And I mean, so for example, what, what could cause a lot of problems are these service accounts that you can use. To, all of a sudden, what you thought was just your small application running in inside your pods could, if escape, actually then also not only get access to one particular node, but also then to the control plane to be able to wreck even more ha havoc. And as an example of what I mentioned before, I mean, you can disallow service accounts to mount the service tokens to actually access the control plane, but that is this is enabled by default. So. Here's just some examples from the official Kubernetes documentation on how to really disable it. So moving on a bit. Uh, I mean, as Cody already mentioned here, what's a very nice, very nice product is this open policy agent that started out pretty small and quickly gained a lot of adoption and really becomes the sort of Kubernetes API firewall that can be used for a lot of things. And here are just some very useful examples that we commonly recommend. Is one simple snippet to the left to show that, well, you're not really allowed to pull images from anywhere but your own local register. And in this case, we use Harbor. And then saying that, well, in order to uh, impose a sort of at least baseline security posture, we should say that, well, all everything that needs to be running should have a network policy attached. So there should be no policy-less policy -less jobs or whatever running. And so, I mean, let, uh, what we see as the sort of main risks here and the what we could use defense in depth against is sort of attacker gaining control of application and then sort of to uh, escaping to the host or getting access to the whole cluster. So we're trying to protect the Kubernetes API, et cetera. And I mean, the pod security policies are highly debated in the sense that they've been in beta forever. They may be replaced by open policy agents soon or not. We really need to find out, but they're very useful. And as an illustration, illustration, there was this very, very recent CV about some uh, network setting for proxying that would very easily enable man in the middle attacks. It spread that basically had all Kubernetes admins across the world updating their clusters. But I mean, if it turns out if you just would disable the ability to do, do this particular operation and network in pod security policies, I mean, you will buy yourself time and you don't need, really need to do the, all those updates yeah, for, for new CVs. I mean, by a very restrictive 
set of capabilities given to to the pods running in the cluster, you will you will buy yourself more time, and hopefully be not having to reinstall and reset up your cluster all the time for each new CV. I mean, it's not guaranteed, but by having a very restrictive set of privileges, you can save yourself quite some effort. And I mean, we we encounter many that well. My pod security policies are very, very liberal because I want to write my applications in a certain way, but you really need to make your security teams and your applications team <laughs> sit down together and discuss more what, what are the practices. And then I see that the big problem we experience is that the, the development teams, they, they love and they understand the cloud native tech, but security teams have very strong opinions about how things should be configured, but they cannot really communicate that in using pod security policy or, or similar cloud native technology. So there's a sort of need for a bridge here between uh, security policy and how it's actually to be implemented in, in Kubernetes. <laughs> similar, and as also Kobe mentioned previously, I mean, there's a very good practice to use uh, network policies perhaps to do some simple uh, rule base for what services can talk to which. And I mean, if you want to get bigger or more complex scenarios, you're likely turning to service mesh here, but you find it a good practice to at least apply some, some basic network policies for everything that you run. And as we also mentioned, intrusion detection is also useful because you're not always getting everything right and there will be new types of attacks that you didn't know. And even though your container passed all the vulnerability scans, I mean, there, there are new vulnerabilities discovered and so on. And I mean, here we, we would recommend going for Falco with the BPF monitoring of the syscall and the, associated anomaly detection to find out uh, if things are going on. And of course, as previously mentioned, vulnerability scanning. And here we see, a, I mean, we're, we're all in the open source space here. And I, th I think we, we see a rich set of scanners and some nice integrations like Harbor and Starboard. But then when it gets to the to sort of lower level uh, scanning of actual code and libraries, there's, there's still a lack of good open source tools, I would say, but this is on the other hand, and a very rich space for commercial providers, a few of which are listed here. And of course, there's a lot of these open source tools. We have discussed some of them already today that will do a lot of checks against various types of best practices for Kubernetes and security. But what we, what we really found here as the main, the main issue is that the, the interpretation of various regulatory standards in cloud native language, that was really missing because many of the specifications and the rules that our, our customers have to live by were written well, not really in the time of punch cards, but virtual machines were really considered a novelty in some of these documents. So even more so, it's very hard to do the translation then to what would this really mean in terms of containers and sort of software defined security policies and these things. So I'll do a super quick uh, overview of just what we're doing. So we've been taking Basically, best practices, open source, and best of breed components from the CNCF landscape, and basically following the CNCF trail map. So you would containerize, you would use CI/CD, and so on. And what would you really need here if you really, if you then also want to add uh, sort of best practices, security, and regulatory compliance? And we really found that there was a pretty good coverage in available in the combination of all of these open source tools, but there was quite a lot, lot of plumbing and integration missing. So that we did, and we certified that as a distribution and we're offering it open source. So, I mean, just to quickly summarize what I'm talking about, try to protect the 
Kubernetes API itself, be very restrictive with what kind of permissions you give to applications and do some sort of scanning to, to capture hopefully the cases where you didn't get it right. Please check out uh, our distribution. We have a .io page with public documentations and links to all our repos. And we also would be very happy to discuss your cloud native compliance needs. And for anyone wanting to do that with my coworker, Jim, we have some free KubeCon tickets that we're happy to share in exchange for a chat. So that's what I wanted to say to you today. Thank you for listening.